Uh, I'm really excited to be here today and to speak to everyone. Um, I want to talk about the long and winding and sometimes um, uh, painful to travel road uh, from idea to impact in web security based on my experience. Um, before I jump in, I actually wanted to share a little bit of, of personal background um, because it will you know, maybe give you some perspective on where I'm coming from. Uh, in college, I became interested in web development um, kind of by accident. Uh, I was not exposed to technology growing up. I had never done any programming. Um, but I wanted to learn the basics of web design to make a web page because I thought it was just a, a creative way to express my, myself. So I taught myself HTML and CSS and JavaScript from online tutorials. Um, and then ended up getting one of my sites hacked. Uh, someone had defaced it and, and was uh, serving Viagra ads from it. And I ended up joining a security club because I wanted to understand what happened. I learned more about web security from this club and then also got some experience doing research with, uh, at the time, a brand new professor. I don't know if he's in the audience. Uh, is Nikita here? Somewhere? He's probably sleeping in. Anyways, <laughs> Nikita um, Borisov was a then new, a new professor uh, and now is a tenured professor at University of Illinois. Um, and a lot of what I learned was from practice, learning with other people, um, doing research projects with Nikita. Um, so it's really great just to be in a room um, full of people who are curious and passionate and like-minded about this, uh, this you know, area of security and distributed systems. So um, I consider the web to be one of the most successful open and distributed systems that we've collectively built and that we are, um, you know, keeping thriving, it's a, a beast to secure. Um, and uh, about six, I, I've been at Google for about 10 years. The first five years I worked as an engineer securing a lot of our web services. About six years ago I joined Chrome. And I joined to lead our security work and try to make both Chrome um, the safest way for people to browse the web as well as just in general push security on the internet forward. So today, there are over 2 billion active installs of Chrome. Um, vast majority of our users are outside of the US. Chrome is available on Windows and Mac OS and Linux and Android and iOS. And it also makes up a big part of the Chromebook um, uh, uh, product or Chrome OS. Um, it's over 10 million lines of C++ code, um, a lot of which is security critical. And it is a huge adventure to, to keep secure. Um, and that's kind of my perspective and uh, where the stories that I'm going to share today come from. OK, um, ideas are cheap, and execution is everything. This is a bit hyperbolic. I don't want anyone to be threatened by this. Um, I'm sure you've all heard some version of this. But I think it's especially true when we're talking about applied security on the internet. And if I've learned anything after 10 years at Google, it's that if defense work uh, in popular software is to have real-world impact. It has to consider the real-world complexities, the ugly details, um, and uh, just the practical constraints that are beyond just the theory of computer science, it's certainly beyond what I studied originally in, in, in college. Um, those foundations are absolutely critical, but not sufficient or a replacement for actually putting those ideas into practice. In this talk, I want to share three relatively simple or, or cheap ideas that led to multi-year arcs of defense work. Um, each of these efforts I've had some involvement in, but they also represent work from dozens of people um, in Chrome, at Google, and then also like you know, lots of people in uh, just the larger you know, community that cares about keeping um, people safe and making systems more secure. All right, jumping in, my first simple or cheap idea was um, we should make Flash less dangerous. <laughs> Some people think this is a funny idea as well. Um, uh, Adobe Flash, I'm sure that most people have some familiarity, but I'm going to start each section with a, a brief intro. It's a multimedia platform developed and distributed by Adobe Systems. Um, it played an incredibly significant role in the web ecosystem since its introduction in 1996. I actually learned how to um, uh, write action script and made a cool game. Um, it's incredibly powerful technology. Flash can manipulate bitmap and vector images. It supports audio and video streaming, and it comes with its own scripting language. Uh, it was particularly powerful um, and popular in advertising media and gaming. 
Now, there have been a number of criticisms of Flash over the years. Um, its lack of support in major mobile operating systems, uh, it's fully proprietary, and that you know has uh, is somewhat ironic given it's kind of a, it was a major web platform technology on the open web. Um, concerns and criticisms of its accessibility and battery usage, and then of course what I sort of expect this audience to care the most about is security risks. So um, let me give you a flavor of the security risks in Flash that um, uh, I'm aware of. So since 2005, there have been over a thousand vulnerabilities with an attached CVE uh, in Flash, and you should consider that a low bar because we know that not all, all vulnerabilities get assigned a unique CVE. In 2011, this was the first time I actually personally saw um, a concrete example of a Flash vulnerability being used to specifically target Gmail users. Um, there was a cross-site scripting vulnerability, and uh, you know we found evidence of, of kind of malware that was collecting usernames and passwords of Gmail users. A little bit more recently, in 2015, um, a firm called Hacking Team. Uh, this was a company that actually sold hacking capabilities to uh, governments, national intelligence agencies, um, including uh, uh, what we would consider oppressive regimes, they got the hack themselves. And actually, 415 gigabytes of email and uh, internal intelligence was dumped and published for the world to, to see. That dump included two flash zero-day exploits, um, one of which in the readme file was described as the most beautiful flash bug uh, for the last four years. Um, but you know, these are examples of, uh, of concrete um, flash exploits that we know are being used to actually attack and harm people. So since Chrome launched in 2008, we've responded to dozens of zero-day exploits. Um, and by this, I mean that we actually have a concrete exploit that's being used um, against people and that there's no actual uh, patch available for. I could spend an entire talk uh, recounting the history of insecurity in Flash, but instead, just you know, take my word for it, that it's a very attractive target for malicious actors given its large distribution, um, its large complex code base, um, and history of, of um, vulnerabilities. Still, I, I do wanna make clear that Flash was an incredibly powerful and po popular technology uh, for the web during the 90s and early 2000s. And if you're gonna build a browser, you have to be able to uh, support the entire web, and that includes Flash content. So given that, uh, I'd like to share some of the ways we've approached Flash security over the past decade. So March 2010, Chrome collaborated with Adobe to bundle Flash by default. At the time, Flash was the most widely used web browser plugin. Um, and so making it available just when you installed Chrome was actually just a, a user convenience. But relevant to security, um, this you know, collaboration, and by that I mean there was NDAs that were signed, also gave Chrome the ability to automatically update uh, Chrome. Chrome was the first browser to automatically update its users, which at the time was actually quite controversial in industry. Um, critics said that automatic updates took uh, choice away from users. Now today, um, it's almost considered a cardinal sin to not automatically update users. And I, and I think there was a, a talk on Sunday at the Usable Security Workshop that talks about quantitative data, uh, about um, you know, user beliefs, um, and underscores uh, related to updates, and underscores how important automatic updates are. Anyways, bundling Flash uh, and giving us a way to distribute an updated Flash was just a major advancement to helping protect users from Flash um, uh, and known vulnerabilities. In 2010, we also began an effort to extend Chrome sandboxes, sandbox to web pages with Flash content, and that actually required defining a new browser plugin interface. Um, we called this Pepper, or PPAPI. The intention was to replace the long-standing NPAPI browser plugin interface. Um, and later in June, we added additional mitigations um, retroactively, it would have been nice if we put these in first, but you know we didn't, to deal with um, the realities of Flash regularly being insecure. So in particular, we added the ability to disable plugins, specifically Flash, for users to be able to operate a domain whitelist mode um, and make it so that they could only uh, restrict Flash to only certain permitted domains. We also worked on a way to disable out-of-date plugins uh, and do component updates. So this made it possible for us to rapidly update Flash separate to the large Chrome binary. And this was one of those things that, you know, in practice, 
Um, it takes much longer for a test team or QA team to actually qualify a full build of Chrome um, you know, on the order of, of days. And so if it was possible for us to update Flash independent of all of Chrome, it's actually a cheaper thing for, for us to do in, in terms of time. Um, uh, it also, we were also able, able to update Flash without users having to restart their browsers, which again is a, is a nice um, uh, perk because we know that not everybody regularly updates their browsers. So this was a major win in terms of being able to respond to Flash exploits. One of the lessons I've, I've learned in software engineering is just how important it is to be able to disable functionality swiftly and to architect software so that you can disable things without essentially needing to shut down your entire program. But hindsight is, is 20 /20. So Flash's popularity um, and history of insecurity made it no surprise that we started seeing an increase in incidents of Flash exploits. Um, we knew that commercial exploit vendors were building or selling Flash exploits. A few were particularly vocal about it. You know, um, most of the time, uh, uh, I, I'm, I've attended more industry conferences than I have um, academic conferences, and so we would see people who would, um, you know, proudly talk about having exploits and um, selling them as a business. One of the most vocal vendors was named Vupen. Uh, they've since gone out of business, but they had a contract with the NSA in 2012. Um, and you know, I will let you draw your own conclusions, but but know that like Flash was a, a major vector for um, you know exploitation. Um, given that, uh, we wanted to invest even more in making Flash secure ourselves. So at this point, we had a pretty close relationship with some of the folks in Adobe Security. Um, they were in San Francisco. A lot of us were also in the Bay Area. Um, we knew that they were you know. They, they were fixing the bugs that we filed and sent as fast as they could. Um, but in terms of resources attacking the problem, uh, we didn't really feel like it, what, what they had uh, was sufficient. And so we wanted to invest more ourselves, um, Chrome and Google. And so uh, in particular, we wanted to invest in fuzzing. One of the luxuries of working at Google is the large compute power we have at our disposal, um, which we ultimately use to fuzz flash. So fuzzing is a type of security testing that aims to get a piece of software to crash um, and thereby exposing bugs that might have security consequences. So we began fuzzing Flash via corpus distillation. Um, that's a fancy word for what you could actually just call dumb fuzzing. Um, and this is where you locate a large number of files, um, in this case Flash files or SWIFTs as they're abbreviated and determine which areas of the code are actually reached by a sample of those files. Finally, you run an algorithm to generate a minimal set of samples that achieve maximal code coverage, and this becomes the basis for your fuzzing. A manageable number of files that exercises lots of code. Um, after you have that corpus, uh, then you can fuzz by just doing very, very simple bit manipulation um, and bit, bit flipping, and actually get a lot of uh, results. So in August 2011, we published results of an effort that we conducted to shake out kind of all of these low-hanging fruit vulnerabilities from Flash. Uh, we started this fuzzing expedition. We looked at 20 terabytes of SWIFT. Um, and again, this is a luxury of working at Google. We regularly index the internet, so it's not hard to find uh, a large corpus of SWIFT files. Um, we fuzzed those on about 2,000 cores, and then via bit flipping, generated crashes. Um, these crashes uh, kind of reduced, we were able to reduce these crashes into 400 unique crash signatures and handed those over to Adobe who had uh, private symbols and actually was able to kind of uh, further reduce those to 106 individual security bugs. Um, the bugs included things like buffer overflows and integer overflows and used after free bugs and object type confusion bugs, bugs that were um, you know, quite practical to actually exploit. And so, um, this was something that we felt was really successful and appreciated how um, you know, Adobe was very much uh, you know, a, a partner in addressing these and, and working with uh, us on this, this effort. So to further take advantage of um, the larger community, in this case the security researcher community, in 2012 we actually added Flash as an in-scope vector to our Ponium exploit program. So um, for a long time, Chrome uh, and, and Google overall have run vulnerability re reward programs where third parties 
uh, can submit vulnerabilities to Google, and based on the severity of that vulnerability, um, you know, you, you can get a financial reward. Anywhere from a couple hundred dollars up to, I think, $100,000 is, is the most we've ever given for sort of a specific contest. Um, we included Flash as uh, in scope for one of our exploit programs in part because we just knew that it was a vector that was um, impacting users. And even though, you know, Flash was not Google's code, we actually didn't have um, access to the source, well, some small set of people had access to the source code to, to build the um, API, but the security team never had access to the, the source code. Um, we still wanted to offer incentives to sort of shake out some of these bugs and ultimately help make the web safer. Um, so we included that, and there were some submissions that we helped pay for. In August of 2012, so this is like two years after we started kind of a concerted effort to help um, uh, reduce the risk of Flash, we finally launched Flash ported to this new PP API platform. Um, uh, by porting Flash from kind of the aging NP API architecture to the sandboxed PP API platform, we could leverage Chrome's full sandbox and kind of all the benefits that a user gets from a multi-process architecture. Um, previously, any page with Flash content couldn't really take advantage of, of any of that. And so this was a huge effort um, and, and also just, you know, made it possible for us to uh, further reduce the, the risk um, of, of Flash content. All right, everything I've talked about so far is very related to security, in part because um, that's what I had more direct insight into in my team. Um, we're, we've talked about shaking out security bugs, finding ways to reduce attack service, and, and kind of respond to Flash exploits faster. But outside of the security team, there was a ton of work happening in our web platform group. And, and this group works with other browser vendors and the larger community um, standards groups to push forward capabilities on the open web platform. Um, and in particular, provide open um, uh, replacements for the needs that were being satisfied by, by Flash. So in particular, there's a lot of work done to improve video support um, in HTML5 to make it a truly viable replacement for uh, video streaming. And in January of 2015, a really big milestone happened, which was YouTube actually defaulting its Flash video player to use HTML5. Um, and then we kind of saw other players in the ecosystem switch as well. So later that year, Twitch TV announced the plans to deprecate Flash player. Um, and at this point, it's totally viable for video players to really take advantage of HTML5 instead of Flash. Um, one uh, large open challenge was still that the ads ecosystem was still heavily reliant on Flash. Uh, and we knew that users were being compromised via Flash ads uh, as well. For example, uh, in August of 2015, one of, uh, a pretty public incident was reported that hackers used Yahoo's ad network to send malware via Flash ads. Um, the ads would specifically target browsers that were running out-of-date versions of the Flash, um, and at this point, I think that there was broad recognition within our team that like, we really need to do more to protect users um, and we should kind of move towards full deprecation uh, on Flash. Um, and to do that, we actually had to address sort of the online advertising reliance um, on the ads ecosystem, on Flash, sorry. So um, years of effort went into setting and then executing on a strategy to just move the large larger ad ecosystem of the web off of Flash and onto HTML5. Uh, one of my colleagues helped spearhead this effort, but also it was a, it was a um, you know, industry effort, and, and certainly browsers um, uh, talked a lot about how to best do this in a way that is not um, entirely disruptive to the web ecosystem and publishers that relied on ads for um, you know, monetization and, and their businesses. Um, Google announced it would help by converting all Flash ads to HTML5. Um, and then ultimately said, also, any of your flash ads that are still around are going to be paused. Um, and the, the motivation for this was actually to improve performance and battery life for users, because it turned out that flash ads were um, especially uh, you know, draining of, of uh, battery. Um, other browsers followed suit afterwards. Microsoft Edge similarly said, we're going to pause flash content for power savings, and, and Firefox followed. Um, in August, Amazon announced that it's no longer going to uh, accept Flash ads. 
Um, New York Times turned off its Flash uh, support. And in general, we just saw much more aggressive action both from browsers as well as ad networks in terms of um, using Flash. This is a graph that shows um, from July 2014 till about today, actually, the percentage of Chrome users that, daily Chrome users that visit at least one Flash site a day. And you can see that um, in July of 2014, there's about 80% of our user, user base um, saw at least one site with Flash on today. And you know, three years later, that was down to 17%. Today, it's less than 8%. And we're seeing this, this downward trend uh, continue, where people are moving away from Flash and towards HTML5. Um, by late 2016, um, the vast majority of Flash that was still on the web, like mostly video has been taken care of, um, large ads also, uh, most uh, display ads were also kind of converted over to HTML5. The large majority of what was remaining were uh, invisible or very tiny pixel ads that were actually used for page analytics. Um, and this is something we only learned after kind of, you know, getting rid of other large classes of Flash. So um, we again announced that we're going to um, take even more aggressive action against this analytics script because it's still causing power problems for users. Um, and we're going to default to HTML5 um, and present sort of this long rollout strategy of how eventually we're going to stop running Flash unless a user explicitly opts into it, um, making it just you know, that much more clear that Flash is on its way out. Um, uh, it was, I guess, um, you know, one thing to take away from this timeline is just that, you know, at this point, a lot of large sites are already using HTML5 as backup, but they were still using, you know, Flash for these tiny ads. Um, and in thinking about the web platform, we do really think about the economics of publishers and content producers because, um, you can't make a quick change. No one likes their cheese being moved. And um, it takes time to actually you know, make these transitions. Um, so we wanted to like, communicate and then over-communicate our rollout strategy. Um, and I, I would say that that was you know, one thing in this long arc um, that uh, was frustrating, but also, um, I think, necessary. So in July of last year, there was actually a joint announcement by Adobe. Google, other major browser vendors, about ultimately ending uh, the, the end of life of Flash in 2020. As you can imagine, we had a huge celebration uh, inside just because um, I, I, I fundamentally do think that um, this was an incredibly powerful technology and created um, a very powerful content, but um, over the course of time um, did not have the investment in security that was uh, needed to kind of match the risk that it was posing to people. And so it's, um, to me, a huge success of the open web platform to be able to replace that functionality um, and for us to get to a point where we can deprecate this in a way that we feel is, is minimally disruptive. Um, one of the things you may be asking yourself is like, you're building a browser. If you thought Flash was so vulnerable at some point, why didn't you just remove or block it? Um, and this is one of the challenges in working on software at scale that I've come to appreciate. Uh, people expect the web to just work. You know, it doesn't... Um, that means rendering legacy content and broken content. And in practice, if it doesn't work, and if you block something, or if something doesn't render, many users will just think that your software is broken, and they will elect uh, to use a different browser. And there have been instances, um, not specifically with Flash, but where we've been uh, especially aggressive on, you know, um, uh, hey, we don't trust this, uh, you know, SSL certificate and don't let a user proceed, and we actually see like a, a, a drop in usage because people um, think it's broken, or and they report like, "Hey, Chrome is broken for um, this this site." So it's a very delicate line to walk, um, and I think has made me appreciate sort of patience in trying to move uh, security on the web forward for you know two billion people. All right, some of the lessons I, I learned from uh, working on Flash security. Just because Flash was made by another company, um, it impacted our users, and thus it was our problem too. You know, it could have been easy for us to just say like, "No, it's Adobe's fault. It's Adobe's fault. This is proprietary code. You know, there's nothing we can do." But at the end of the day, users don't care um, if their Gmail is compromised. You know, they don't know or care, and they shouldn't have to about like which part of the software stack um, uh, was at fault. 
And so Flash was our problem, and uh, we had to invest in it kind of you know, over the course of its life. Uh, dump fuzzing was incredibly effective uh, at shaking out low-hanging fruit. And so if you are uh, approaching fuzzing and sort of, uh, I would encourage you to, to do things that are, are dumb. I think there was some hesitancy in approaching uh, fuzzing of Flash early on because you know, we wouldn't have been able to build a protocol-aware fuzzer, and we didn't have, um, you know, maybe something that could do something intelligent, but dumb fuzzing was, was exceptionally effective um, at finding a lot of vulnerabilities. I think we learned a lot about incident response uh, in dealing with Flash, and again, like over 30, day, 30 zero day exploits from uh, the time uh, I've been in Chrome. Retroactively, it's always harder to add in um, componentization or ways to actually limit functionality. Um, and especially if you're trying to balance usability and not throw users uh, a million options that they need to configure. Um, and this has informed other engineering projects. And then just overall, moving an ecosystem onto another technology uh, stack just takes effort. And it takes action from lots of different people and heavy coordination and communication. Um, things that uh, I, again, didn't appreciate probably when I was taking an operating systems class. But just in practice, the real world is complex. Um, you need to think about building alternatives and think about the incentives to move, negotiate timelines, uh, and probably above all, be patient, which is um, actually a theme in the, the next story that I'm going to share as well. So that was a, kind of a, a look back at um, 10 years of securing Flash. The next brilliant or simple and cheap idea um, that I want to talk about is um, uh, we should make HTTP, uh, we should mark it as not secure in the browser. All right, it's early, so I'll just do a really quick overview. Uh, I'm sure most people um, uh, here are well aware of the risks of HTTP, but um, networking on the internet feels safe to a lot of people. Um, it feels uh, you know, like you're talking directly to some service. People open a browser, it sends off a request, some magic happens, and, um, you know, a page loads. And they don't really realize that, you know, there's this, this response, uh, um, this whole protocol that's happening. It feels like you're talking privately, but in reality, you know, we all know that there's almost always a few places between um, a client and a server, or your browser and a service you're trying to reach, um, that someone can access the network uh, and um, service that you're trying to reach. This can be an internet service provider, it can be a router operated by a third party, um, or some other intermediate. And if you're communicating in clear text protocols, which we all know that HTTP is, you know, you have no guarantee that the data hasn't been logged or tampered with. Um, we call this a man in the middle attack, and as the name suggests, it's when an attacker places himself or his malicious software in between the victim and a valuable resource. We talk about theoretical man in the middle uh, a lot, um, but we also see a lot of incidents of man in the middle attacks in the real world. Um, if there are any other unfortunate uh, Comcast customers in the audience, um, Comcast has, has done man in the middle attacks. I'm, I'm an unfortunate Comcast uh, customer where they've introduced courtesy notices, um, but are, these are completely injecting um, you know, their own content into um, non-encrypted streams. I've seen examples of ad injection as well, where someone's actually trying to profit um, off of, um, you know, uh, um, ad man in the middle injecting. Um, large telco companies, uh, if you look at kind of some of the um, uh, user license um, uh, policies that you subscribe to, um, at least I saw a report of one in Canada where it was possible to track and store all of the data um, relevant to someone's TV viewing and calling patterns and web browsing habits. Um, there's also been a lot of examples of large, well-funded organizations of cyber criminals or governments um, in 2015, I think, uh, during the, um, a, a lot of uprising in uh, the Middle East, the Tunisian gover government faced a countrywide revolt, and they actually injected a bit of password grabbing code into Facebook's login page um, whenever it was requested by a user in their country. So we've seen a lot of concrete examples of man-in-the-middle attacks. We know it happens. Um, HTTPS, or 
hypertext transfer protocol secure. It's a communication protocol for secure, commu commu secure communications over the internet. Um, HTTPS is just the layering of security capabilities of TLS to standard HTTP, and you know it's the heart of uh, secure HTTP. So in late 2014, some of the people in my team and myself started talking about how it's kind of silly and unfortunate that we don't actively warn people when they're accessing sites over HTTP. So this is what our connection, securities look, uh, connection security indicators look like back in 2014. And we did um, a user research study to just kind of assess what users actually uh, thought of, of these three classes that we had of connection indicators. So uh, just to go over them, you can see that the top one is supposed to indicate like everything is good with this HTTP connection, no problems. Um, that middle uh, dubious um, indicator was supposed to indicate when um, the top level page was being um, served over HTTPS, but it also had some HTTP content in it. And we call this mixed content. And the reason it's dubious is because if a page is serving any of its content over HTTP, there's still the potential for um, that site to be, you know, man in the middle. So we, we kind of uh, wanted to present to users like, okay, like some of it's over HTTPS, but not all of it. And then we have these, these examples of bad where, um, you know, the HTT, there's like something wrong with the SSL certificate and we think, you know, there's really a suspect, uh, something suspicious is going on in this SSL connection or just plain HTTP. Our results from the survey were that people were just totally confused by the yellow triangle. No one understood what that meant. Um, some people felt some alarm with the red lock People felt like the green lock, like there was something good that was going on there and something secure uh, about it. Um, and there was no reaction or confusion to the HTTP icon, which um, is supposed to be just a, a blank uh, page. So given HTTP is certainly no worse or no um, less secure than broken HTTPS or this mixed dubious um, sign, this just really seemed like the wrong state to be showing to users. So we wanted to um, definitely address this and hopefully get to a point where we could actually more actively warn users about uh, what we saw as such the obvious dangers of clear text protocol. All right, HTTPS has literally been around since 1994. Um, it was first implemented by Netscape. It was formally specified in 2000. Um, but adoption has been, you know, relatively low, given it's been around for so long. Um, and I think, you know, around this time, still broadly considered by a lot of web developers as something that only banks should implement. Um, there were probably a variety of reasons we started talking about this more actively in 2014. You know, this was post Snowden disclosures. Um, the web platform was getting increasingly powerful features. You know, it was, it's possible for web developers to get access to your geolocation um, via web platform APIs. It's possible to, to access and control your camera or your microphone. Um, and so recognizing that much more powerful capabilities were coming to the web platform, it also seemed really important to have, um, you know, some kind of baseline for security. And I think just generally uh, with our team wanting to push safety on the web forward, but recognizing that like, we really just don't have any foundation without HTTPS. So um, a lot of those things contributed in 2014 to an effort, really just kind of bottoms up effort within our team to try to push things a little bit um, faster. Uh, we knew that users don't generally perceive the absence of a warning sign, right? Like how would you perceive the absence of a warning? Um, but the only situation that web browsers were guaranteed not to warn users was actually in the situation where there was absolutely no security. Um, uh, when users were accessing over HTTP, they got no warning. So this just seemed like a very broken state. At the same time, we also knew that false, um, every false alarm reduces the credibility of a warning system. Um, and so given that at the time, a majority of the web no matter how we measured it, was still not using HTTPS, we also didn't want to suddenly flip things around, um, scare people away from using the web, and also just, you know, um, ultimately fatigue them or desensitize them to, to warnings. So 
We began this multi-year effort to progressively and eventually show that HTTP origins are not secure in a more affirmative way. Our ultimate goal was and, and has um, been and, and still is just to help users better perceive that HTTP origins are not secure, no security, no privacy. Um, uh, you can have no expectation of uh, integrity in your communication. In 2014, we floated a browser UI proposal to our public wiki. If you're interested in, in the gory and um, unpolished details of Chromium security, we have a public wiki page and we throw ideas up there. We have a public mailing list uh, where we welcome feedback from anybody. Um, and in general, the response was actually really positive. Um, that, you know, the larger community agreed this was the right thing to do. There was a lot of concern around you know, the current state of the web, and again, like, you know, user fatigue around warnings. There was uh, concern around, well, we can't really, you know, actively show that HTTPS is secure because you could still have a phishing site over HTTPS, and that's sort of like a, a separate orthogonal issue that we, we still talk about. But in general, the response to actually moving the web and browser indicators forward was, was really good. Um, we thought our proposal was the right thing to do, but we also knew that we had to find a way to drive HTTPS adoption um, because it just wasn't happening fast enough by itself. And it turned out that for a lot of large sites, migrating to HTTPS required overcoming challenges that just weren't strictly technical in, in nature. So some of the top hurdles for um, sites. And these were things that we learned, um, you know, in part, uh, Google is not a representative uh, website um, uh, publisher, right? We have, like, that is the core of our business, and we have a lot of built-up expertise in how to build websites, and so a lot of, like, the solutions that we used for Google products weren't transferable to um, the New York Times or to kind of the, the long tail of small sites. So we learned a lot about what some of the top hurdles were for sites to move. First, motivation was, was a big one. Um, there, was, there was this uh, myth that, um, you know, I think we've, we've dispelled uh, quite a bit more today, but maybe still permeates a bit, that HTTPS was just for banks. It's like this super fancy um, advanced security technology. And we had to explain in much simpler terms that there is no way a website can have any guarantee about the integrity or privacy of its data without HTTPS. That actually won't solve all your problems, but that's just a baseline. Um, and so there was a lot of myth dispelling we had to, to have just around um, Having sites understand why they would they would why they need this and what what risks they actually were um, putting themselves uh, and their users um, up against without supporting HTTPS. A second top hurdle was around revenue and performance. So a lot of people wanted to know, look, is this going to cost me a lot of money? Um, I make my 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 site is monetized from ads and like. Are ads supported over HTTPS? I have I use a CDN for content hosting. I don't know if like that's going to change what I have to what I have to do, um, and also concerns around performance. Uh, so we had to um, dig into all of these concerns. In some cases, we actually talked to some CDNs who were doing kind of sketchy things and uh, charging people um, more, and you know sort of had those conversations and exposed those a little bit. Um, in general, we think that it's, it's quite practical to. Um, have a CDN that um, supports static content over HTTPS. Ads, uh, something I, I have a, another slide about, but in, in parallel, Google was actually working on um, making more of its uh, ads project, products served over HTTPS, so that also didn't impact um, the ad auction prices for, for sites. Performance was something that was um, absolutely true about 10 years ago, but there's been a lot of Im improvements um, to the performance of HTTPS as well, to where we also thought that this was kind of a, a myth. Um, absolutely, TLS will incur some small performance cost, um, but the cost can be optimized away with, with the right settings um, on a site. And in general, there's a lot of performance wins if you're using HTTPS with things like HTTP2 that only actually work over TLS encrypted connections. So we were able to have discussion um, in a more nuanced way with sites around uh, performance concerns um, and also learned you know, ourselves uh, what things were still holding people back and how we could actually um, help from an engineering perspective uh, with those things. So I mentioned uh, Google's ad products were in parallel aggressively moving to HTTPS. Um, and so this was actually you know, incredibly important um, in 
uh, getting um, the larger drive of the web to HTTPS. And then one other aspect that, you know, I think we underestimated the complexity of going in was all of the dependencies that sites had on third-party content, like um, analytics libraries, for example. Um, ultimately, driving HTTPS adoption has required shifts across the larger web ecosystem and a lot of different verticals uh, in it. Um, December 2015, we launched a security panel within Chrome's DevTool feature, um, and this helps developers just make it a lot easier to debug the reason for why their HTTPS might be broken. Um, this is a screenshot of the tool. We did a lot of um, you know, online tutorials and workshops with site devs. As I mentioned, a really common problem was um, having third-party content that wasn't served over HTTPS, and this just made it much easier for developers to diagnose those and then ultimately fix them. So in March of 2016, we launched an HTTPS transparency report. Um, and this showed HTTPS status across a variety of different axes um, and included actually Google's product support, um, HTTPS traffic sliced by country and platform. So we show kind of the, the pie chart of um, desktop and mobile. It's, um, it's not real time updated, but it is summary regularly updated and um, is, has interesting data to show. The, the reason we wanted to do this was, again, just to bring more awareness to the current state of the world and also um, use data uh, and Google's unique view of um, the web, both via Chrome as well as traffic that Google sees, to kind of share you know, what we see the larger ecosystem uh, doing. One of the parts of the report also shows the HTTP status for the top 100 sites um, at the time. Now this was a mix of our own um, measurement uh, from traffic, uh, Alexa, and then a couple of other signals. Um, and we tried to stay true to the top 100 sites, so um, there were some adult sites in there too, but that's also important to have a secure connection to. Um, as you can see, in 2016, less than half of the top 100 sites on the web support or default to HTTPS. So that's sort of like circa 2016. Um, after months of research, um, months of additional user research, we published a pa paper at SOUPS, um, so a Symposium of Usable, Usable Privacy and Security, about rethinking connection indicators. Um, and shortly afterwards, we actually um, officially announced our broader browser UI plans. So, you know, previously we kind of just threw a wiki page up there and said, hey, let us know what you think about it. But this um, time we were being much more uh, serious and saying, like, this is our, we're, we're putting a, a stake in the ground and this is our plan for Chrome uh, to eventually make changes. The Soup's paper, um, which I encourage everyone to read, evaluated current security indicators across major browsers, and you can see, um, uh, you know, one of the, fig the figure on the left shows uh, what major browsers were doing um, uh, in the different states related to connection security. Um, it uh, reviewed what existed today, but also reconsidered what we wanted, what we should have in a browser with respect to modern browser requirement needs. So a lot of the research that had been done in this space would, was done, you know, before the mobile web was a thing. Um, and so thinking through kind of um, some of the constraints of the modern web and browser needs today was, was novel. Um, we shared in this paper the shortcomings of Chrome's current indicators and then also proposed new indicators based on multiple rounds of user testing. What we ended up with is um, on the right, which you can see there, or if you're a, a Chrome user, you can see some of this uh, in your browser. This paper actually became incredibly important as reference because everyone in the larger security, security community <laughs> and all of their friends had a personal opinion about what the correct indicator would look like. Um, there's a funny story where um, one of the women who uh, really led this research, uh, her name's Adrienne Porter Feltz, uh, we had gotten sweatshirts with the Chrome security logo. Uh, let's see if you can, well, it's the red one that looks like um, essentially, a, uh, I would think it would look like a white lock with an X in it, but her sister actually thought it was a purse. And so, um, just anecdotally, it was, it was really interesting to hear personal opinions. When we first presented our, our plan, we also got a lot of feedback about like, no, we shouldn't have this, you should have a lock. It was really important to actually have done this research and um, 
uh, be able to explain kind of, you know, the data-backed reasoning um, that we use to make these changes. Okay, um, so in January of last year, 2017, we actually rolled out the first phase of our UI evolution, um, which is indicating that HTTP is not secure on pages that users submit passwords and credit cards for. Um, I can't tell, I can't read the audience from up here, but maybe some of you think this is like obvious and not controversial, but that is not the case. And for every wave that we've made in these changes, we get a lot of pushback from site developers saying, you know, this is Google monop being, you know, a monopoly. And, um, uh, you know, um, uh, listening to that feedback and pulling out what, you know, is legitimate concerns and acting on it versus um, sifting through what is a lot of change aversion um, is always a challenge. Anyways, um, I think that was a huge milestone for us, being able to actually show that HTTP is not secure for sites that submit passwords and, and credit cards. Um, one of the uh, other practical challenges in this process is that we didn't actually want to commit to all of the hard dates up front. Um, again, this is where we're tracking HTTPS adoption overall, and we're very leery of uh, introducing warning fatigue um, but we also wanted the world to know that we're serious and recognize that some people are not going to make changes unless, um, you know, there's, there's actually some penalty for it. Um, you know, there's procrastinators everywhere. And so figuring out, like, how to both convey that we're serious and we're going to do this and here's approximately what we're thinking, but also um, leaving ourselves open to interpret, like, how the larger web is responding uh, was, was another practical challenge. October of last year, we added the case where if you're browsing in Chrome, in addition to seeing not secure for sites over HTTP where you're inserting a credit card or a password, you'll also see this when you're browsing in incognito. And then just recently, we're really excited to have announced that we will mark HTTP sites as not secure in July of this year, all HTTP sites. And so that will look like this, which again, perhaps is boring, but many years <laughs> of work. Um, since 2014, another thing I haven't maybe talked as explicitly about, but um, a lot of people in our team, in Chrome overall, at Google and, and other browsers as well, have just been involved in developer education and outreach to top sites, um, finding ways to help uh, in whatever way is needed, whether it's um, helping to talk to leadership uh, at your organization and convince them that this is worth investing in. Um, at the end of the day, a lot of organizations, you know, have to make hard resource decisions and hard prioritization decisions. And so kind of helping with some of those discussions about, no, why you shouldn't, you know, do this other feature work, but actually should spend time moving to HTTPS was something that people have helped with. Um, they're not novel or new problems, but there are things that actually have helped us identify tipping points in the web that then get other people to, to follow. Um, we work with the search team to start discussions around thinking about HTTPS as a search signal um, because we knew that that would be relevant to some folks that are you know, really sensitive to any kind of search engine optimization they can do. And we've supported efforts like Let's Encrypt, which brings the cost of HTTPS down um, for a lot of small to medium sites. Um, and just on a lot of international travel to some extent, preaching the message of HTTPS, which um, sometimes is challenging because it's not a new technology. Uh, it's been around for a long time, but um, getting people to actually take action on it has been a challenge. I mentioned Let's Encrypt. Let's Encrypt is a free and automated certificate authority that provides command line tools to make renewing your certificates easy and automated. If you have a personal page and you're feeling a little bit embarrassed right now because it's not over HTTPS, and you're at a security conference, um, you could probably set up a Let's Encrypt certificate, you know, during the duration of my program, no judgment. Um, uh, <laughs> um, so uh, this is a graph to just show the incredible growth of Let's Encrypt over the past year. Uh, actually, sorry, this was 2016. I wasn't able to get a 2017 graph. Um, platforms like WordPress and Squarespace and other popular publishing platforms use Let's Encrypt and just make it really easy for people to get automatic certificates. Um, 
And you know, this I think is, is not something that, I mean, this is a, a separate uh, organization that we help support with uh, in the way that Google can um, with advice or money, but uh, was also a really big, um, had a really big role in, in helping to push HTTPS. Eventually, uh, we would like to get to a point where we can even more aggressively uh, talk about the risk of HTTP, and, and uh, you know, this is even a louder warning than what we had previously. Um, we have other bold ideas of, you know, how useful is the URL in general as a security indicator to users? And um, maybe it's the case that we never have to show it unless we actually know that something is, is insecure. Um, I think thinking about security, usable security uh, for the mobile web where the screen real estate is just so small has also made us really try to think about what are the most important visual cues that we can give to users. At the end of the day, people want content on the web. They don't necessarily want you know, a URL bar that doesn't actually um, create, uh, you know, give much uh, interaction. And so we've been thinking about how to be even bolder here, but um, this would probably be the next big bold step. After all of that work, where are we today? So as of today, um, well over half of the top sites support, top 100 sites on the web support and default to HTTPS. Um, I mentioned this transparency report. You can find it easily with your favorite search engine, but um, I just took one screenshot from this morning, and we can see that the percentage of pages over HTTPS, at least according to, to Chrome's view of the world, um, by country has also been steadily rising. So uh, in March of 2015, about 44% of pages loaded um, in the US were over HTTPS. Today, that's about 80%. Um, and it's interesting to dig into to some of these. Um, there's a lot of interesting anecdotes as well. Uh, I traveled to Japan to work with some top um, sites in Japan and just talk, to, talk through with them you know, what their plans were for HTTPS and um, just learning about around the world like different um, cultural apprehensions or motivations was interesting. There, um, I kind of you know, learned from some of the local developers, just there's a, a real first mover problem in adopting any new technology. Um, once one of the larger sites moved and announced they were moving, then all of the other top players like, f felt like then they needed to actually do it because there would be like a, a huge source of shame if they actually were the ones that weren't using HTTPS. But there wasn't actually a motivation to move until at least one major site in Japan had moved. So it was very interesting just to learn about how people think about technology um, uh, around the world. I, it was in uh, Korea and um, talking to a reporter who, uh, it was very clear that the reporter thought HTTPS was a Google technology um, and was trying to, was asking me to convince them why Korean sites should use, you know, Google HTTPS and why Korea couldn't have their own, um, you know, their own alternate solution and why Chrome wouldn't, you know, honor that. And so I, I tried to, like, get into a conversation of, about standards and the open web, but, like, I, I do not think I was successful uh, in, doing, in doing that. So um, some lessons learned from years of driving HTTPS. Um, first, we needed a business case for change. Like, it was great that we were talking about, you know, security and this is the right thing to do for users and privacy and, you know, integrity, encrypt, like, all the stuff that we talk about at, um, within our own world, but at the end of the day, we actually needed a business case to make change and to be able to talk about why someone should do this um, in, uh, in, 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 for reasons beyond just it's the right thing to do for users. Um, the, uh, um, as I mentioned, the soups paper and research in general was really critical to making these changes happen. Um, there were a couple of, of other papers that we published in working on this space. Um, one looked into certificate, SSL certificate errors and causes of SSL certificate errors because, you know, if uh, uh, users are seeing a lot of warnings for an error with their certificate, then they're also going to be desensitized to those and potentially, you know, ignore whatever aggressive warning we show. And so figuring out how to help web developers correct some of those common errors was um, uh, a really important part, I think, to our overall strategy for, like, pushing HTTPS adoption, but also making it better and more secure, right? If we're pushing this technology, we better also make sure that um, it, it's secure. Uh, Ecosystem changes can take time, and, and this is similar to Flash. Uh, again, like 
the ugly uh, realities of the complex web really uh, show here. And, and I also think those are really interesting, but sometimes frustrating that it can take uh, so time and then uh, so long. And then, as I mentioned, there's actually been a number of interesting conspiracy theories about um, why we are doing this work. And it's every, anytime I see an article um, that like, you know, Google is pushing HTTPS for this reason. I find it just very funny because in, in a lot of ways this was just a bunch of, you know, hippie excess EFF um, people who want to make the web a little bit more secure that, that drove things. And certainly there's a, there's a, bit, there's, um, a huge uh, advantage for Google to care about the security of the web, but um, a lot of the conspiracy theories are, are much more interesting than reality. All right, I'm gonna take a glass, one last sip of water and then we'll share this last story. Okay, um, last simple idea. Um, we should use Chrome Sandbox, this thing we brag about all the time to isolate websites too. So this last story is what is ultimately a large refactoring project in Chrome. And unlike the first two examples where um, we were trying to make changes across the larger web ecosystem, this project actually had um, much fewer dependencies on the outside world. Um, there were still some, but uh, that didn't necessarily make it easy. Um, so uh, this is Chrome's 10th birthday. Um, we're celebrating, we're having a party with cupcakes. Um, when Chrome launched 10 years ago, it was the first browser to launch with a multi-process architecture and a, a fully file system isolated sandbox. Um, at the time, this was actually like really revolutionary. And it provided an experience that was faster and more stable and of course, um, more secure. Let's refresh uh, what that means at a very high level. So instead of all of a browser's functionality happening in one monolithic process, Chrome has the concept of a browser process or browser kernel, which functions like uh, a, an operating system kernel might or an IO proxy for multiple different separate renderer processes. Um, a renderer is what uh, renders HTML and JavaScript and paints actually the pixels to the screen uh, of a web page. So from a security perspective, this is the part of Chrome that we fully trust and it runs at the highest privilege level. Um, this browser process brokers access to most of the system resources, including the profile and any persistent data. We want to try to keep this small because, again, it's fully trusted and it runs at the highest privilege level. If there's a problem there, then you can, uh, uh, it can lead to a full system compromise. So every time somebody visits a web page, um, the browser process will create a renderer process. And that renderer process runs at a lower privilege than the browser process. Again, the renderer is what draws pixels of the web page to the screen. Um, when Chrome launched, it used the WebKit renderer. Um, uh, and uh, this was an existing project. Uh, Safari uses it. There's other browsers that use it as well. Um, and uh, you know, that's what we use for, for that big green box. Now, a lot of things can go wrong in the renderer. Um, it needs to be really fast. It's doing a lot of complex work, and so bugs are gonna happen. Um, and since it's run as a separate process at a lower privilege, we have some security benefits, right? Because if there's a bug that's exposed um, when rendering a web page, it doesn't actually lead to the whole browser system being uh, compromised. Now, obviously, these two processes have to talk to each other, so Chrome has inter-process communication, which you call IPC. And every time a user opens up a new tab, you get a new process. So beyond renderers, there are a lot of other isolated processes that provide core functionality uh, and require different privilege levels. I'm gonna just leave all those details out of uh, this diagram. We actually do have a, a more thorough threat diagram, again, on our wiki if you are interested in those gory details, but they're not super important for uh, this specific example. Okay, multiple processes help the browser feel fast. Um, uh, because it allows for parallel execution. Um, it helps the browser feel stable because if you have, if you're rendering one web page um, and something goes wrong, it doesn't crash the entire browser. You just crash that tab and we give you a little, a little sad face in, uh, in Chrome. Um, and that actually is, um, you know, as much as we want to uh, make our renderer um, not have any bugs, it's just a reality of kind of having to render the complexity and diversity of content that's on the web. So we kind of just expect there's gonna be some bugs, renders are gonna crash sometimes, at least this doesn't bring down your whole browser. 
And then most relevant, of course, to this audience is the file system isolated sandbox helps protect a user's computer from the web. If there's a bug in the renderer, since it's lowing, rendering at a lower privilege than the browser process, it doesn't mean, it doesn't lead to your browser being able to install malware um, on your uh, machine or to steal local devices on your computer. Oh, zero minutes? Um, oh, wow, time went fast. Okay, um, I'm gonna talk faster. Now, uh, in practice, and due to compatibility constraints, um, web pages from different sites would and do often share the same process. Um, that is surprising and disappointing to a lot of people, but it would um, regularly happen because uh, a website can include resources from another site in an iframe. Um, this is also known as cross-site uh, iframes. So, in other words, the downside of the original Chrome sandbox was that it only protects your local machine from malicious web content. It doesn't actually protect web content from different sites. Um, instead, we rely on the renderer's implementation of the same origin principle. And if a renderer is compromised um, and there's an issue with the same origin principle, then we kind of get into a situation where web data is exposed. And we've had a number of bugs in the history of Chrome in the same origin principle implementation, so it's not a totally theoretical uh, risk. All right, when I joined Chrome in 2013, I met an engineer named Charlie Reese, and he was thinking about how to practically improve isolation of web applications. He does PhD at University of Washington, if there are any of University of Washington people here, um, on browser robustness and security, and he also did an internship in Chrome. And um, in 2009, uh, based on some of his work during his internship, he published something um, that kind of recognized that web apps were becoming increasingly complex and isolation um, you know, became more important for actually the architecture of a browser. Uh, candidly, pursuing this project only became realistic when Chrome forked from WebKit um, to start the Blink project. Uh, Chrome started with WebKit just because it was lightweight and powerful, but increasingly Chrome wanted to make ch changes to support sort of its multi-process architecture, and these changes would have just been too drastic for the existing project. So that's another one of these like, painful dependencies of, of the real world. Um, we already talked about Chrome's original sandbox. What we were wanting to move towards um, required support for something called out-of-process iframes. Um, and this required just massive changes to Chrome's architecture um, to make it possible to actually run a child frame from a different site in a different process than its parent frame. Um, the infrastructure took multiple years to get ready, and you may be thinking, like, why did it take that long? Um, it took almost exactly two years to build Chrome from scratch, and that was accepting WebKit, um, a fully functional uh, uh, renderer. Um, this actually, in some ways, was like rewriting all of the renderer, so it was a huge refactoring project. Um, and Chrome and Blink also are used by a lot of other projects and vendors, and so in some ways, the team was constantly having to manage dependencies, communicate pro uh, progress, and just dealing with new requirements as they popped up over the years. Um, progress was continuing steadily through to 2017, and late last year, um, some of you may have heard about some of these um, uh, vulnerabilities in speculative ex execution in practically all modern CPUs. Um, we were notified of these because they were reachable from um, the web. And I had sort of a unique vantage point here because I also actually managed the Project Zero research team um, who didn't realize that, this was, uh, that these were reachable from the web. Um, it turns out that, uh, I mean, I would encourage you to read the technical blog post. I won't even attempt to um, do justice to it here. Um, the high-level impact is that all CPUs have a flaw, which means that user-level programs can read anything in their address space um, via timing attacks. And coincidentally, site isolation avoids putting cross-site data into the same renderer process. So it was almost ideal mitigation to these types of attacks. Um, the team was able to do a, a last push to actually um, get this available for our enterprise customers as well as an optional um, feature, and uh, we were able to publish that before like these vulnerabilities were broadly published, and the team's working on being able to um, enable those for all of our desktop users by the end of the year, potentially some um, of our mobile Chrome users as well. Oh, okay, lessons learned. So we're still in the bowels of this project, um, working through a number of small issues to make it so that we can actually uh, really enable it for everybody. 
Um, this project was ultimately a refactoring project of an existing browser, and it's really hard to redesign and rebuild the engine of a plane that's in mid-flight, but that was one of the practical um, complexities that the team has had to work on. Um, uh, when you're refactoring an existing code base, you end up having to pay the tax of helping others along the way um, and just navigate a lot of constraints. One of the things that I think this project has really emphasized is that details matter, and proto prototypes don't always expose all of the questions that you need to answer. Um, and uh, in general, there's just a lot of trade-offs um, and detail in how to make an idea actually productionized. Um, it's totally possible, though, and um, in this case, it'll take about a decade, um, but if you have the stamina and also support within the organization, this is the kind of project that actually can have a huge impact on users. Um, I think within Chrome, because we, use, we work mostly from an open source code base, we've actually had a lot of successful collaborations with researchers. And um, uh, I, I do think, I absolutely ag uh, agree that um, we are inspired by the, the ideas that come from academia. Um, and then finally, defense in depth is uh, worth investing in. And it was just totally coincidental that this was um, almost a near-perfect mitigation for Spectre, um, but in general kind of, uh, you know, reiterates that it's important to invest in defense and in depth um, within industry. All right, um, sorry, I was talking way too slow, but uh, I've presented a, a, a long um, high-level history of three major efforts that we've done in Chrome to improve browser and web security. If there's anything I would like um, everyone to take away from this talk, it's that if you want your ideas to have impact in the real world, you need to consider the ecosystems that you are operating in. Um, consider and investigate the practical constraints, dig into the details, consider a multi-pronged and interdisciplinary approach, um, and also just you know persistence is key. I um, constantly have to remind myself this because I consider myself actually fairly impatient, um, but it's important to have patience and just keep hope that things will get better. Thank you so much. Yeah, so I'm, I, I'm happy to take questions now, but I know I'm way over time, and I'm also around for the rest of the day, too, so if we want to do some. I think a couple of questions now will be fine. So I'll, I'll, I'll start with one. Sure. Um, following up on the last thing you said, Rissa, so some of, some of your lessons for uh, how, to, how to do research that has a practical impact, uh, they're hard to implement if you're a PhD student. So I wonder if you... I don't know if you have a refinement of those for, for a PhD student who you know, can't necessarily take the long view or you know, is, is thinks that, oh, there's so many practical constraints, which ones do I really worry about? I wonder if there's any more specific guidance. Well, I guess my um, experience is relevant to Chrome, and I would say that we've actually had, like, a, I, would, I would totally encourage people to consider internships or sabbaticals for any professors that want to uh, do that, but Chromium is, um, is all open source, and we have a lot of developer documentation to make it so that anybody can contribute. Um, majority of people that contribute to the project are still Google employees, but we have like 30% of the people that work on Chromium are not Google employees, and so are contributing from, from other places. Um, in general, I think contributing to large open source projects actually introduce the kind of constraints that are painful, but um, I don't think um, our uh, insurmountable just be, you know, because you're a PhD, and, and uh, um, there are communities that you can get help. I, I know that we've, we've had people that have come to do internships and then re return to academia, but keep working on this. And Charlie was actually um, doing his PhD and an intern at, at Google, um, went back to finish his PhD and then published a paper and decided to, to join. But um, if you're interested in browser security, I'm happy to give concrete um, examples, and I think we've had some some successful collaborations. I don't want to, um, I don't, uh, I, I do recognize that there are just um, a lot of challenges to doing research, you know, in a colossus that is Chrome. And when I did my limited amount of research, there was a lot of abstractions and prototypes that, you know, maybe made it uh, um, not possible to realize um, the full impact on the world, but um, I think still made the work valuable. So. Uh, hi, Ben Schock from CISPA. Uh, thanks for the very interesting talk. 
Um, you said one thing about um, kind of the new security indicators and the relation to kind of phishing. So I'm always wondering whether if you train people, it's like, okay, the green lock is the, the good thing, whether, I mean, as you said it yourself, there might be kind of a problem with phishing. Uh, can you kind of comment on that, what your thoughts are, how you could address this? Yeah, so I don't think, um, I think it's a concern. Um, and I, I don't maybe have the most satisfying answer to this because um, if we are showing uh, a, the current view, f the current uh, presentation for Chrome would actually show, you know, secure. And so, like, if you are reading that, you probably, it's reasonable to assume that somebody would assume that everything about this is secure, and that's clearly not the case, right? If you, you can uh, create a malicious site and get a valid SSL certificate, and it's not a secure site. Um, I don't think that uh, the PKI and general network security should be in the business of, um, uh, detecting phishing, so I think of it as an orthogonal problem. Um, I, uh, we rely really heavily on um, safe browsing, which is a technology that's developed from Google and also available as, a, as uh, in third-party APIs and other browsers to, to try to help protect people from sites that we think are, are malicious. So I think of them as orthogonal problems, but I, I the um, concern raised that we are letting people uh, have the false sense of security is there and something that I'm not entirely sure uh, how to address in total because I also don't think, um, yeah, PK should be in the business of assessing site quality. All right, I encourage everybody to come uh, talk to Parisa uh, after the session or, or later in the day and with that, let's please thank her again. Thank you.